So my name is Vicky, as you already know, and I'm doing a, a part-time practice-based PhD at UAL, at CRISAP. Um, and I'm also a sound artist, so my research is in sound art. The title of the research is Mapping Experiences of Inner Sound. Um, and then what I wanted to do today was to talk through this research, but focusing on the practical work that I've been doing, uh, because I have found throughout the research that that work raises some quite interesting questions and sort of provides a different way for me to research, if that makes sense, rather than reading and writing. So uh, what I'll do is I'll give you a brief overview of the research um, and then talk through five of my works, what influenced me making those works and what came out of them afterwards. Okay. Um, so um, my research is on inner sound, which also what I'm interested in is sounds that we think about, uh, sounds in our minds, in our thoughts, in our memories, that sort of thing. And, and the first thing I had to do when I started this research was define what I mean when I say inner sound, because that term didn't quite exist before this. Um, so what I mean when I say inner sounds are sounds you hear as part of your conscious and unconscious mind, similar to but different from an inner voice. So basically any sounds you experience is, as part of your inner world of thoughts is what I'm interested in. Um, and the second thing, which I know everyone has to do but which I find quite challenging was to define a context for this research. Um, so I'm a sound artist and this is a sound art PhD, but because there isn't that much written on this particular um, topic in sound art, I had to branch out and just go to other areas and get um, a context from those areas. So I had to go to philosophy, phenomenology, performance art, psychology, um, all sorts of places to sort of Put together a context for my research um, and once I've done that I thought um, in sound is quite a large topic quite nebulous quite hard to talk about so um, I thought it would be helpful to have a taxonomy of inner sound so basically different inner sounds um, what they are and how I define them uh, I won't really go into the taxonomy too much in this presentation but I'll go over it very quickly now because it's kind of the good way of telling you where I was at in my research at that stage. So the taxonomy that I defined was the following. Um, it has four kinds of inner sounds. They are created in the sound, so that's consciously, consciously created or imagined in the sound. Uh, conscious inner sounds, which is what we use as part of our thought process and inner voice. Um, triggered inner sounds, which are influenced or triggered by outside events, experiences or objects. And uh, lastly, spontaneous inner sounds, which is uncontrolled, not consciously created, uh, sometimes wanted and pleasant and sometimes unwanted and frightening. So I've gone through this whole process and I have uh, sort of defined quite a rigid and possibly narrow area of research for myself uh, on the one hand. On the other hand, I started thinking about all these other questions that didn't quite fit into this quite narrow area of research which among others were, can we really hear inner sounds in our minds without our ears? What role does sound play in our thought process, if any? And um, how can we communicate and discuss sounds we only hear in our own mind? And why do we often consider sounds we hear in our minds as dangerous? And at this particular stage, I felt quite stuck because I didn't quite know how to explore these questions within the quite very rigid framework I had set up to myself. And this is why in this presentation, I'm quite interested in the practical work that I did because it allowed me just a different way of approaching these questions that I didn't quite know how to fit into my very nicely, neatly defined context and um, definition of inner sound. So what I'll do is I'll talk through the works. Um, I'll tell you what, when, what sort of inspired me doing them, what went into doing the works, um, what the work is, obviously, and then questions that sort of came out of the works afterwards. So the first one I wanted to mention is called Pages. Um, it was made actually quite early on in the PhD, probably around the same time as I struggled to define that taxonomy. Um, and the work is a number of books. I read the books. I paid attention to my experiences of inner sound as I read them. I marked anything that triggered an inner sound in the book, both by underlining it and by stitching in 
these little ribbons of tracing paper that you can see on that top image. And, and what influenced this work was this frustration with how do we communicate about inner sound. So sound is quite hard to communicate generally. We often talk about what makes the sound, so like the sound of a car. But if I am talking about sounds in my mind, where I don't know what makes them or where they come from, they're quite hard to articulate. There's not really a language for it. And this was an attempt at some sort of way of externalizing these inner sounds I experienced in my mind. Obviously, it doesn't quite work because all I'm doing is marking the trigger for the inner sound. Uh, but in a way, that failure is kind of quite interesting in itself. Um, and as you can see, I think it's an interactive piece. So I want people to read it. I want people to interact with it. And hopefully <clears throat> it might trigger inner sounds within them or they might think about doing their own books. So that was sort of I was thinking when I made the work. <clears throat> um, and I wanted to include it because I haven't thought about it for a while, but now thinking back, it actually raises a couple of interesting questions, thinking about it afterwards that I didn't think about making it. So the first one I already mentioned is how can we communicate about uh, what I hear in my inner world of sound when we don't have a language for it. Um, also, I think it raises the question of how do we think not only about sound, but through sound. So just the sounds I, inner sounds I hear when I uh, read these books help me understand the book, help me understand the world, is a part of my thought process and not just sort of a soundtrack to reading. Um, and also raises the question of if I read this book and I didn't pay attention to my inner sound world, would those sounds somehow still be there in my mind? So are inner sound always conscious? And are there sounds in our minds which remain unheard? Both of those questions I find really interesting um, and has sort of influenced work that I've done after this. So I wanted to include this start. Um, the, the second piece I wanted to talk about is called Sonic Confessions. Um, this is a performance piece. It's a one-to-one -one performance and it sort of takes the shape of a somewhat tongue-in-cheek therapy appointment. So you as the audience would come and see me um, about your inner sound with the underlying assumption that those inner sounds are bad for you and you want to get help and you want to get rid of them. And, and what this work came from was a frustration in, so for me, inner sounds was something positive and I worked very hard to cut out of my research area anything in relation to inner sounds being dangerous or mental health issues or anything like that, but yet it kept coming up. People kept telling me about, oh, inner sounds are not great, we shouldn't be talking about them, they're not, they're not nice. So there was a frustration with this that I tried to play with in this particular piece of, of work. Um, it's a very hard work to document because as soon as you bring a camera in there or a video camera in there, it kind of ruins it. So I don't have a proper documentation, but I have a short video I'll show you of uh, just photographs. The first time I perform this work in Oxford. It's only a couple of minutes long, so I'll show you that now and then I'll talk a bit more about the work. So as I 
said this work well a few things went into it but one of the main things was the frustration with this idea that inner sounds are dangerous and um, but as i performed this work and as i have reflected on it afterwards um actually f is quite a turning point in my phd because uh, reflecting on it afterwards i realized that i shouldn't really be afraid of this idea of inner sounds being dangerous in fact um, now I'm quite interested in, in why are they seen to be so dangerous and is, just, is it just inner sounds that are considered dangerous um, or all sounds perhaps dangerous in some way and that question has become quite central to the research on inner sound and I find it now really really interesting and it is not just to do with mental health it is not just to do um with hearing things or being unwell it is just um, a cultural assumption we have that hearing things in our mind is dangerous and i'm really interested in finding out why um, and how that influences sounds generally and i wouldn't really have pushed a phd in that direction if it wasn't for this particular piece of work uh, so i'm really glad that i did it and the next piece I'll talk about is called uh, Oral Science. It's also a performance piece um, done to quite a small group of people and it takes the form of a seance but instead of trying to contact a ghost or um, spiritual spirit of some sort we instead listen towards inner sounds together. Um, the, what went into this work was um, so I've been reading um, a lot of Maurice Merleau-Ponty philosophy, which don't worry, I won't go into right now. Uh, but there's this one concept um, in Merleau-Ponty's philosophy, um, which is the pre-personal, where he talks about how when we, we like to think that we are very clearly defined what is inside us and what is the outside world. But what he talks about is often when we walk around outside and see something that, um, border between us and the outside world is actually not that clear because we don't always walk around thinking about that so if you walk around you see a tree you don't think to yourself i am seeing a tree you just think tree or you see a tree and that kind of blurs that border between yourself and the outside world and for me researching in the sound i thought this was quite an interesting concept to play around with because in that sort of gray area where we are open to the outside world and they kind of cross over is that an area where we could perhaps listen to inner sound collectively as our inner is sort of open to the outer world and then also to other people um, and that's i think i have a clearer idea of it now when i've uh, done the work but some sort of that idea went into this particular piece of work um, again it's quite a hard piece to document because you can't really a camera in it to kind of ruins it and um, so again i have a short video of photographs i definitely won't play the full one because we're kind of running a bit low on time but i'll play a short part of it so you get a feel for the work Thank you for joining me in this sacred listening space. I won't bore you by telling you of the dangers of exploring the oral subliminal landscape. You all know those. Before we start, I want you to take a deep breath. Centre yourselves. Focus. Now close your eyes, take another deep breath, now I want you to listen closely. I need you to listen for the sound of darkness. Sorry, I think that's all we have time for. Um, so with uh, this particular work, doing it and then thinking back on it, um, I am very interested in if this sort of listening, so listening to inner sounds together, if it's possible. And if it is possible, 
can we then use that to bypass this sort of problem of communication and talking about sound and instead of trying to put it into language could we just listen together to inner sounds and somehow have a communal inner listening experience and um, and if we can does that then mean that sounds and inner sounds actually negates and transgresses our border of self so it's one of the reasons that we find sounds a bit dangerous the fact that it moves in and out of us and the outside world and is very hard to contain which if you think about sound it is very hard to contain if you you play something in one room it will bleed into another room you can't shut it away and um, if you go to listen to a concert the sound will be outside and will also be going through you sort of thing um, and following on from that what i'm really interested in at the moment is um what is inner sounds or sounds in general's relationship with the idea of with our cultural idea i should say of the other so because we often project onto the other that which is not us things that are hard to control or which transgresses borders and that sort of stuff um, and that all those questions came out of doing this piece of work and then thinking back on it afterwards. Well, I am aware of the time, so I'm going to be really quick. I wanted to finish on uh, these two works that I've done quite recently, so I haven't quite had time to reflect on them, uh, but they kind of follow on from all the other works and the ideas that came out in those works. So uh, the first one is called Sonic Contagion, which I feel a bit bad talking about right now, but it's the idea of what would happen if there was a sonic contagion so a sonic virus that affected humanity um, and if you don't think there is such a thing there kind of is um, an earworm is called is the sonic contagion so if you get a melody stuck in your mind that's thought of as a sonic virus um, so what would happen how would it spread would we try and stop the spread by making people not being able to talk and in that case would it spread in different ways through the body to inner sound uh, and the other piece is called uh, Wicked Witch, You and Me. It's a score um, and very briefly, it requires two people and gives instructions for you to take up a position often in very close proximity to each other and then listen towards each other's inner sounds. And why I wanted to finish on these two pieces of work is because um, I started this PhD with a very strict and narrow definition of inner sound but encountered all of these other questions so I didn't find out what to do with um, did these pieces of work and came to the realization that maybe sound are not that neatly defined um, and safe and what I'm really interested in right now and what I find very uh, exciting right now is what is the possibilities of sounds when they're dangerous so what is the possibilities of sounds when they transgress negate borders refuses containment invades and seduces and these two work is kind of on the one side is maybe when it's dangerous and not good and on the other side is this ability for sound to then connect us if that makes sense so i wanted to finish on that thank you so much for listening um i'm going to try and come out of this shared screen now in a minute. Brilliant. Thanks, thanks a lot, Victoria. So I've unmuted myself and uh, we've got quite a few like really interesting questions here that like everyone can see. But I'll uh, just read them out to you so that we have something that's a bit more uh, lively and like save you having to read them out yourself. Um, so actually, I'm going to start with uh, not the first question here, but uh, one that relates directly to danger by uh, Catherine McBride, who's asking, uh, regarding inner sound and danger, there is quite a bit of research on kinds of things that people who hear voices hear their voices saying to them. And between brackets, I know this isn't inner sound in your definition, but it might be interesting. Basically, it's very culturally determined what kinds of things these voices say and what they say also determines whether they are experienced as negative or positive or related to other vectors of danger slash norm relations. So is that something that you'd like to respond to uh, concerning your research? Sure, I should say that my research isn't really on hearing voices and I'm not definitely not an expert in that. Um, but I think generally it's what I've read of hearing voices. Um, it is very culturally determined anyway. In some cultures it's seen as 
really bad in our culture is often seen as you need to go and see a psychiatrist um, in other cultures it might be in relation to spiritual experiences um, and I'm not surprised that it's culturally determined what kind of things the voices say and if this is good or bad um, but I mean some people live with hearing voices and perfectly normal happy lives and some people don't and it's not always in relation to what the voices say but just your experiences of them and I'm kind of interested in this cultural idea we have of sound that we don't often talk about that is just not something objective that happens a physical thing but that we experience sound in a cultural way and that that will vary from culture to culture I'm not sure if that answered it but <laughs> yeah and no, i think it's a really interesting sort of like general reflection to have around like that distinction between hearing voices and sound. There's another question here by uh, Matthew Hopkins, which sort of like touches on that also. So the question goes, apart from the danger of uh, being psychosis, psychosis, sorry, hallucination, um, did anything come up from people about otherness being part of the danger? As in, was there a danger in hearing yourself as the other? This idea of the sound and the other is something I just recently started looking into. But I guess as a general idea, yes, people spend a lot of time trying not to be the other. So to hear yourself as the other would probably, at least to some people, be dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like th this idea oh. it's, it's really interesting how you like used performance in a way to sort of like maybe externalize these ideas which are like really hard to like put words on and i think like with the fact you were talking about the challenges of actually being able to record that is like very representative of that type of uh research um just to go on with uh oops questions now i've got some more coming in so i've got lost a bit of track um so someone uh, so louise gray here is asking um have you used psychoanalysis edith lecourt's work on the sonically defined body uh, not many texts are available but it's very interesting in terms of sonic self-identity and psychos psychosis it might be of use uh, for the unwanted sound section. Thank you. <laughs> I haven't, but I will definitely look it up. Uh, again, I should say it is not, even though it's very interesting, this idea of uh, sound, mental illness, psychosis, and the connections between them is definitely not my area of expertise. And it's not something that the majority of the research isn't on that. I'm sort of more, interested in how it influences our ideas of sound rather than more of a mm -hmm. clinical idea of it or because i'm not a doctor and i'm definitely not an expert on it but i will look it up for sure thank you i'm really interested in the way in which like you've like used your practice and performance as a way of actually sort of like material like trying to like give a materiality um to this idea of sound and it really connects to a question here by robert who says, um, I've had the pleasure of experiencing some of your works, like Confessions in Oxford. Are there not sounds that are not only of the mind as of, uh, can you still hear me? Oh, suddenly got messages from the <laughs> screen. Um, sorry, so um, are there not sounds that are not only of the mind as of the body too? How might a, how might a certain mind slash body issue be addressed by the research? Um, I think that really connects to like, like in a lot of photos that we could see, like we could see you sort of like physically touching the participants in your performances and that kind of stuff. And I think that's something that's quite interesting. Yeah, I didn't actually go into it that much um, in this presentation, sorry. But I think thinking about inner sound in general, you have to start questioning this mind body divide anyway, which is the reason why I looked into Merleau Ponty in the first place, because he kind of does question that quite a bit. Um, and it is true, I would even say, how do you know it's actually sounds in your mind and not sounds from the outside, or both, or also sounds from your body? And what is the difference between sounds in your mind and sounds on your, in your body? Um, 
it might not have a huge uh, part in this research, but maybe someone else should do a PhD on it. But it's sort of, the question is definitely there, or the questioning of this mind-body divide. I have found it very inherent in just talking about hearing with your mind, because normally you hear with your ears, also we say. So if we talk about sound in, in your mind, you, you have to question this idea of the body hears and the mind makes sense of it. So yeah totally there's kind of no way of knowing really <laughs> what you're hearing is is just in your mind or outside of your mind or you know some weird states in between yeah and so connecting that to sort of like the staging the performances that you've been doing there's a question here by uh, morton paulson um asking in oral seance uh are the inner sounds influenced by the visual staging uh, there might be. I do, in that one, I particularly ask people to close their eyes and I hope usually they do, <laughs> uh, to get rid of that visual influence. Uh, but the setup is very like, also a little bit tongue in cheek, Victorian sort of seance. And that's deliberate so that you have this idea that you are about to embark on some sort of connecting with the spiritual realm or connecting with something you don't normally connect with I guess uh, but again it's very hard our senses don't operate separately anyway do they they kind of operate all together so it's quite hard to tell mm -hmm. what is influenced by the visual and, and not if that makes sense there's actually a question uh, here by the same person who's um asking in this piece so I'm assuming it's uh it might, it, the question came a bit earlier than the question about oral sounds. It might have been about confessions. Um, but are you whispering sounds in their ears as well? And I think that would be quite nice to sort of like maybe elaborate a little bit on like the kind of interactions that you have with people and like how you might actually be coaxing some inner sounds. Um. <laughs> sure. Um, so yeah, there are other uh, concerns in that work that I didn't quite go into in this presentation. And one of them is uh, this idea of when you constantly ask people to speak about their inner experiences is quite intrusive. <laughs> and the performance plays a little bit on that intrusiveness, which is why I whisper in their ear. Uh, but how it works is I will ask them to fill in a questionnaire um, to sort of get them thinking about inner sounds. That questionnaire will very much focus on sounds you don't like, inner sounds you don't want to talk about, and inner sounds you don't like. And then I will, um, as the sound doctor, as she is called, uh, speak to them about this, uh, but just be a little bit too interested maybe in the inner sounds that they don't like. Um, and what I whispered, I will um, talk to them and then I'll give them a sound to listen to instead of these sounds that they don't like, they will get another sound that they can meditate on. Um, and what I whisper to them at the end is that the dangerous sounds are the sounds I like the best and sort of don't be scared of them. So that's, the, <laughs> that's how that is. It's like sounds are dangerous, but they are also pleasant. And there's that tension between the two that the work sort of tries to get at. Mm -hmm. And so that you can have both this feeling of inner sounds not being pleasant, but they are also inner sounds that you are going to find pleasant. And that's fine sort of thing. That's okay. interesting. So have you like done a bit of like research around connecting to like other experience, like other types of experiences that actually try and like build on people's perception of sound and like the re that relation to their body? Because someone here is asking if you're aware of ASMR, autonomous sensory meridian response, and like it might not be directed re um, directly relevant to inner sounds, but it's incredibly interesting. Have you like tried to develop that kind of parallel in your research also? No, I am aware of it, yes. No, I haven't really got into that, no. <laughs> Again, maybe something someone should do. Um, but in my research at the moment, I very much want to focus on sort of inner sounds. Not to say that there's not a connection, obviously, to ASMR or any other sounds that we hear. And I very much argue that how we experience inner sounds influence how we experience all sounds. Um, but I am trying to keep it just sort of two sounds we experience in our mind, because otherwise it gets, yeah, it just gets too wide as 
we noticed already there's so many interesting angles to it that it's, it's hard to cut them out but you're gonna have to that is the challenge of the phd yeah. isn't it yeah. is like being able to like keep it narrowed and i'm coming at this like as a complete lay person because i have no sort of like prior like, background in terms of um like sound art or anything but i find it extremely interesting how like it does connect to this sort of like meditative kind of approach and sort of like seeing your videos and hearing like the way that you like sort of describe the um, the workshop and sort of like like closing eyes and being in a space together is all like very like, intriguing in a way and i think it really connects to things that we experience in like normal life um and actually sort of, like drawing attention to them is uh, quite an interesting experience so we're really we've got three minutes left and like there are no more questions in the chat but i just wanted to ask one myself Okay. maybe you could talk a little bit about how like um what, maybe what kind of challenges you've had or like the, what you might be finding particularly interesting in terms of connecting research with practice and like using the performance and how like, you were talking about the challenges of uh, documenting this but like maybe elaborate a little bit on how you're conducting research through these performances I, find, I mean believe it or not doing a phd i actually find writing quite different <laughs> <laughs> so um, what the idea is, uh, what I find useful is to sort of reflect on the work and write about them, but the challenge is doing that in a sort of coherent way and bringing in the relevant people and reflecting on it sort of in an academic way. I think, I feel like I know what these, that's why I'm quite interested in this idea of research through, you know, practical work. Because I feel like I know what I want to say with these works, but then getting it out, putting it on paper, talking about it in a presentation, I find that quite challenging. But I guess you just have to keep working at it, <laughs> rewriting and rewriting. Um, but also, yeah, to your point, it's very interesting. How do you document performance? Because any documentation is sort of flawed in a sense. And could we do it maybe in a not a straightforward photography not film but maybe in another way maybe even a sound recording so i'm kind of thinking about that at the moment because i do need some sort of documentation but, yeah. but it was felt like the performance is the thing like that is the research <laughs> and any documentation is yeah yeah that is like the craft of research through practice i'm sorry i'm having to cut this but i'm getting a message coming up saying that we've got less than a minute so i just wanted to like take the time to wrap up and say thank you very much it was like an incredibly uh, interesting presentation and thank you all for attending and for your questions which were also very very rich um, um it might cut me off mid-sentence but this is going to be uh this has been recorded and will be uh uploaded onto the postgrad community uh section of the ual website so if there's anything that you would like to sort of like re uh, listen to uh, that's a great way of uh, having access to this and we're also uh, running another session uh, that's focusing more on textiles um, on Monday. So uh, tune into the postgrad community uh, sort of uh, newsletters and things like that to find out about that. We're also going to be advertising that on social media. Still UAL postgrad community. So uh, thanks all for being there. And thanks especially to you, Victoria. Thank you guys for coming. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye.